All right. It's great to see you guys. You guys can take your seats. Let me just take a moment as you're getting your seats to welcome those of you who could not be here in person but are online. We just want to welcome you. And as always, we're encouraged and blessed that you've chose to tune in with us. Uh, but for those of you who are here, let me just take a moment, as has already been expressed, I want to take a minute just to uh, say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, you know, and grandfathers, stepfathers, foster fathers, uh, great-grandfathers, fathers that maybe you're a spiritual father, a mentor to somebody. You know, I just want to wish you a Happy Father's Day and express to you just the significance of your role. You know, your role is, is, is bigger than you can even imagine. You set the temperament and the tone of your home. And, you know, you are probably your sons and your daughters first heroes in your lives. And so, you know, kudos to you. And, and as Pastor Darren had uh, alluded to and even said uh, this morning, that uh, there's some great fathers in here. And I can attest to that. There are some really good men in here that I, I have a great respect for and I admire and so I just want to take a minute uh, to, again, wish you Happy Father's Day um, and actually pray for you if you're a father. And so if you're a dad in this place, would you stand up? Dad, grandfather, stand up, because I just want to, I really want to pray for all the dads here. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, if you would, let's bow our heads once again so we can pray for these, these men. Lord, thank you for all the fathers, for the new ones who endure sleepless nights with infants in arms, for the busy ones who judge, who juggle the pressures of home and family life, uh, for the steadfast ones who nurture and care for our special vulnerable children, for the patient ones who always seek to forgive and engage with their preteens, for the persistent ones who, who cleverly find new ways to connect with their young adults, for the fathers, uncles, who step in to cradle and care for nieces and nephews, for the granddads who love and support their precious grandchildren, for the foster dads that are called to gather and cover the fragile ones, for the Sunday dads who care for our children and lead them in faith, for the dads who give far beyond their own resources, who overcome disability to cherish and love. Thank you, Lord, for all of our beautiful fathers. Help us to support them and to keep them in our prayers. Continue to use them, Lord, to be a godly influence in their homes and in their families and in their communities and in their families, God. Just bless them. And even today, as they gather with family, I pray, God, that they are uh, relished in your love and in your grace and, and in the love of their, their children, Lord, and their families, Lord God, and that they're celebrated for all that they do, Lord, and their commitment to you and to them. And so bless them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you, fathers. Amen. It is, it is a blessing uh, to have you here today. If you're just joining us, we're in a series right now through the book of Philippians entitled Choose Joy, which I'm going to continue in. If you missed part one, I want to encourage you to go online, uh, get on our podcast, get on the website, and you want to listen to the first uh, installment of the series, I believe that it will be an encouragement to you. There will be some things there for sure that you'll be able to, to use in your life, um, and, and so do that. But today we're in part two uh, as in our series, Choose Joy. Now, one of the common mistakes many of us make, and I've talked about this before, but one of the common mistakes that many people make is we fall into the trap of when and then thinking. How many of you know what when and then thinking is? When and then thinking. When I was younger, I often had this mentality, when and then. When I get a car, then I'll be happy. When I get a job, then I'll be happy. When I, have a, when I meet the right girl, then I'll be happy. When I have more money, when I have a, the career I want, when I you know, get married, when I have a house of my own, then I'll be happy. You know, when my kids are grown up and gone, then I'll be really happy. <laughs> I'm just messing. You know what I mean? But that is when, then thinking. But as we learned last week, happiness is, the, is a byproduct. It's the result of our choosing. Happiness is not something that, you know what I mean? It, it, it's a choice. It's a decision that we make. The truth is, 
If you're unhappy, it has more to do with the decisions that you've made in your life, right? Because happiness, again, is a byproduct. It's the result of decisions that we made. And so, again, if there are things in your life that you're not happy about, think about some of the decisions that you've made in your life. Now, that being said, there are actually four common barriers. There are four common barriers that can impede upon your happiness. Four things that can actually rob you of joy. And I want to give them to you real quickly because we're going to be talking about them through this service. But the first one is pain. How many of you know when you're in physical pain, it's hard to be happy? It's hard to be happy. Has anybody ever had any kidney stones or gallstones? Well, call me a stoner because I've had them all. And I've had them multiple times. You know what I mean? And let me tell you, they are painful. They are painful. When you have, a, when you have gallstones or kidney stones, there is not any physical position that you can be in that is comfortable. You can lay down. You can bend over. You can lay on your side. You can try to stretch out. But when, when it's kicking in, there is nothing that is more painful. I've even talked to uh, some nurses who've told me that, you know, they've had, they've had multiple babies and they've had kidney stones. And they've told me that kidney stones were actually more painful. You know what I mean? And so, man, when you're in physical pain, it's, it's very hard to be a happy camper. How many of you know that's true? It's very hard to be happy when you're in physical pain. And so uh, definitely pain is something that can impede upon your happiness. The second thing that can rob you of joy is people. How many of you know that people can totally steal your joy? I mean, people can cause you just to lose it. You know why? Because people can be irritating. They can be demanding. They can be uncooperative. They can be ungrateful. They can be spiteful. They can be whiners and complainers. You know, people have a way of just robbing you of your joy. I remember hearing how a young girl locked herself in her room and her dad, you know, chased up, uh, he went upstairs and started knocking on her door. What's the matter? What's the matter? And she says, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. And her father says to her, why? What, what's the matter? And she says, because you're a people and people stink. You know what I mean? And how many of you know that sometimes people can really put you on a bummer? You know, and so uh, people can definitely be a joy uh, kill sometimes. The third thing that can rob you of joy is pressure. You know, pressure from within and even pressure from without. You know, both internal and external pressure. Uh, pressure. And the fourth thing that can rob you of joy is problems. Problems can cause you to lose your joy. And as you know, problems come in 31 flavors. Problems come in all different shapes and sizes. You know what I mean? And so these things can rob you of your happiness. Pain, people, pressures, and problems can be joy killers. Right? But here in Philippians chapter 1, where we're going to be reading in just a minute, Paul talks about all four of these things, but shows us how, by his personal experience, how you can still be joyful no matter what's going on in your life. That you can still be joyful no matter what's happening in your life. Let me remind you, when Paul penned this letter, if you were here last Sunday, I told, I, we were talking about just the, the history of this book. When Paul penned this letter, he was actually in a prison cell writing this letter, but yet this letter is the most joyful letter in the New Testament, yet he was writing from a prison cell, right? As a matter of fact, in Philippians 1.13, it says this, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. He was actually in prison, not because of some crime he had committed, but he was in prison because of his faith because of his faith, and yet he was writing this beautiful letter to the church of Philippi about how to be joyful in spite of what's going on in your life. And I pray that, you know, whatever it is that might be going on in your life today, because I know that, you know, we come into church and there's some really handsome people here, and that we come into church and we have our Sunday's best on, and we have our Sunday halo on, and we have our Sunday smile on, and we even have our our, our Christianese dialogue, you know what I'm talking about? Hey, God bless you, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But deep down, there are things in your life that are hurting. There are things in your life that are not perfect, that, that you know, maybe you aren't happy right now because of a relationship or because of something happening at your job 
or something that's happened in your, your life. I don't know. But I know that life happens sometimes, you know what I mean? And, and it can get the best of us. But here's the thing. You know, the Bible tells us that, again, joy is a decision. And so because of that, there are certain things that we can develop in our lives. I want to call them habits of happiness. Habits of happiness. There are certain habits that you can develop in your life that regardless of what's going on in your life, you can still have joy no matter what. And Paul, he demonstrates this in his life. And I mean, I mean when you think about his predicament, when you pr- think about his circumstances, he had every reason to be angry because he was unjustly uh, treated. He was beaten. He was abused. I mean, he had every reason to be resentful. He had every reason to be bitter. And yet he was the most joyful person in spite of his circumstances. Even in the most difficult of times, Paul maintained a joyful disposition. And so I'm going to, uh, through this series, we're going to be talking about different habits that produce happiness and different decisions that we can make that lead to being a joyful person. I don't even know, there are so many people that are negative. There are so many people that are, that are just always on a bummer. There's like a cloud over them. And I'll tell you what, as God's people, the Bible says that you are the light of the world. God calls us to be light. God calls us to bring joy into people's lives. And so, man, if, if, if it begins with anybody, I, I tell you what, it, beling, it begins with us as God's people that we should, you know, be people that lift people up, that encourage people, that bring light and life to our families, to our communities, to our friends, you know what I mean? Especially right now where people are discouraged about the economy, people are discouraged about a whole bunch of different things. They're discouraged about the political system, they're discouraged about, you know, just, man, you can name it, work and a a bunch of things. And so it's so important that we know how to be joyful in spite of these things, you know what I mean? Because we're always going to face things, but again, how can we, you know, get through these things and still have a positive attitude, still have an attitude that is one of joy in spite of what we're facing, right? And again, this is not me making light of maybe some of the things that you might be going through because I know that some of us go through some really challenging things, but I still want to tell you that it's possible to have joy in spite of them. And so what I want to do is I want to read through the passage and then we'll back up and then we'll kind of, you know, just take it apart a bit and hopefully extract some insight But we're in Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verses 12. And so if you have a Bible, turn it there. If not, the verses should be on the screen. And so Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verses 12, and it says this. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, and listen to what he says, that everything that has happened to me here has helped me to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, Most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. And so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means, for, li- means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. And so I really don't know which is better. I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you Grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, enduring, 
citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. I'm going to stop right there for now. But Paul is writing to his friends in the church of Philippi who were near and dear to his heart as he speaks of four potential joy robbers that he personally uh, encountered it in his own life, but again, shows us how it's possible to stay joyful even when encountering things of this nature. The key verse is the verse that I stopped on. It's in verses 27, and I like to read it in the NIV, and he says this, whatever happens, this is how it reads in the NIV, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. I've entitled this message, Whatever happens, we can have joy. Whatever happens, we can have joy. You know, and so Paul's going to talk about four things, and I want to uh, point out four things with you. And so if you're taking notes, you want to write this down. The, f- the first habit uh, that he talks about when we're faced with uncertainty, when we're faced with unexpected things that happen to us in life is the importance of looking at every problem from God's perspective or from the perspective of God's word. Something I've both witnessed and discovered in my my personal life is that being joyful, listen carefully to what I'm going to say because it's important, being joyful is directly connected to having the proper perspective. Being joyful is directly connected in being able to see the big picture, in being able to see the big picture. Like you need to learn how to be a big picture person. You need to be able to step back. You know, like it's been said, sometimes we're too close to the trees to see the forest. In order for you to appreciate the forest, you need to step back so that you can actually have a good look at things for what they really are. You know, when I don't have the big picture, when I don't have the proper perspective, when I don't see things from God's point of view, it's easy. It's easy to, to become discouraged. It's easy to become frustrated it's easy to become unhappy because i'm not seeing the big picture and when i'm not seeing things from that vantage point trust me i I could be on a bummer just like anybody else the truth is you know here's the thing no matter what you're going through whether it is good bad or ugly whether whether it is relational whether it is occupational whether it whatever it might be financial whatever it is when you have the big picture you can still have joy. You can still have joy, right? You can take comfort in knowing that, hey, you know what? It's going to be okay because you have a big picture mindset. And, and you understand that God is able to take care of everything, right? The Bible says this, and I'm going to talk more about this later, but the Bible says this in Romans 8, 28, and you guys know this, right? For we know, I love how that scripture begins, that verse begins. We know it begins with the word of affirmation. It begins with the word of assurance. We know, in other words, we can be absolutely assured of this truth that Paul was getting ready to say. What truth is that? He says, we know that God causes everything, not Most things, not some things, not even 95% of things. But he says, we know that God causes everything, listen to that, everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. When you have that perspective, when you have that understanding You are able to have peace. You are able to have joy because you know that ultimately God is working everything out for our good. Even those things that are painful. Now, don't misunderstand what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying that everything that happens in life is good and and it will turn good. That's not what it's saying, right? That's not at all what it's saying. It's saying that even the bad things in life, God is able to use and make something good out of it. How many of you make cake? Are you guys bakers? Is anybody bakers in here? If you made cake, you know this. When you make cake, I mean, think about the ingredients. There's nothing tasteful about those ingredients by themselves. Flour, salt, oil, some yeast, you know what I mean? Eggs by themselves. All by themselves, it it really doesn't, there's nothing really appetizing. But something happens when you mix those things together and you stick it in the fire. Right? All of a sudden, you mix those things together, you stick it in the fire, something very tasteful, 
something very delicious comes out of that, right? Because it's all put together. Well, God is able to do that with our lives. He's able to take those things that are sweet, that are bitter, that are salty, that are not so tasteful, mix them all up, put them through the fire of life, but then out comes this beautiful thing, right? Out comes this beautiful thing. God is able to do that, right? He's able to take our sins. He's able to take our faults. He's able to take our shortcomings. He's able to take our experiences, however good or bad they might have been, and ultimately work it for our best interests, right? And so this is why Paul starts off this section in verses 12 by saying, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, he uses that term, that everything, you see that? That everything that has happened to me has helped to spread the good news. Everything, my imprisonment, my hardships, all of these things, God is using it for the furtherance of his kingdom. That was his perspective. That was his mindset. Now, in order to fully grasp what Paul is saying here, you have to have the, the, you have to know the backstory. And the backstory is this. Not long after Paul's conversion to Christianity, and some of you may or may not know this, prior to Paul becoming a Christian, he was persecuting Christians. He was actually putting Christians in jail. He was actually having some of them, you know, imprisoned and beaten, and some were even killed for their faith. But then Paul gets saved all of a sudden, and he becomes one of the greatest advocates for Christ and Christianity. And so not long after Paul's conversion to Christianity and God does this incredible work in his life, Paul recognizes that, you know what, I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Rome because at the time, Rome was the center of the universe. It was the most strategic city in the entire world. And he wanted to go there and he wanted to preach the gospel. What he wanted to do is probably what we, you know, what you hear about every year. You know, Pastor Greg Laurie has what we call the Harvest Crusade every year. And so that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to go to the Colosseum in Rome, and he wanted to preach the gospel, right? And that was his vision. That was his dream. But apparently, God had different plans for him. His plans were completely different. Instead, Paul ends up being imprisoned for his faith. Now, in the beginning, who knows what Paul was thinking? He's like, man, this wasn't the plan, God. What's going on? But God had a different plan for him. And as Paul's in prison, he's, he's chained to a guard 24 hours a day. Chained to a guard 24 hours a day. So for two years, he's, he's in this prison, chained to a palace guard for 24 hours a day. Now, as I was reading this and studying this passage, what I've discovered was every four hours, they would change out the guard. Right? They would change out the guard. This, and so this happened over the course of two years. <clears throat> and after adding this all up, it's very possible that Paul witnessed to 4,380 guards. Think about that. I mean, think about Paul talking to these people. Verse 13 again says this, For everyone here, look what he says, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. He says, in other words... I've been talking to every single one of them, right? My question is, who's the real prisoner here? You know what I mean? Who's the real prisoner here? Here Paul's talking to all of them about Jesus. And so Paul may have wanted to hold a crusade in Rome, but God had different plans. As a matter of fact, because Paul was in prison for two years, guess what he was doing for two years? He was writing what we know today as most of the New Testament by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for Paul being in prison, we wouldn't have the books that we have in the Bible. We wouldn't have any of them. We wouldn't have Romans, which we know that the book of Romans is like the constitution of the Christian faith. We wouldn't have First and Second Corinthians. We wouldn't have Galatians. We wouldn't have Ephesians. We wouldn't have uh, Philippians. We wouldn't have Colossians. We wouldn't have any of those books. First and Second Timothy, First and Second Thessalonians, Titus, Philemon, and possibly even the book of Hebrews Paul was responsible for writing. I mean, we wouldn't have any of those things. And so this is how Paul was able to say, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me has happened for the furtherance of the gospel so that the good news can be preached. Everything. And, and I want you to take comfort in that, that everything that happens in your life, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, God is using that for his purposes. God has a plan for your life. I mean, 
This is how Paul was able to be joyful even in a prison cell. He saw the big picture. I wonder this morning if you see the big picture. If you see the big picture. Because again, I don't know what it is that you're going through. You know, people come through the doors and I have no idea what has happened during the week. Some of you may have lost a loved one. Some of you may have lost a job. Some of you may have had a breakup. Some of you may have had who knows what's going on in your life. And you're carrying stuff in your life that is heavy, right? And so I have no idea what's going on in your life. But I wonder, do you see the big picture? Do you have the perspective that you need to have so that you're able to continue to move forward and still have a positive and joyful outlook? And so what I want to do for just a moment, I don't ever normally do this, but I just want to stop here for a second. And I want you to think of a trial or a hardship a heartbreak, a heartache, a setback that you're facing right now, and I want you to close your eyes for 30 seconds. Just close your eyes. If you're sitting there, close your eyes, and I want you to pray this. Simple prayer. God, help me to see the big picture. Open my eyes to things that I'm not aware of. God, help me to see the big picture because I need to see because I don't have clarity and I don't understand. And so help me to see in Jesus' name. Amen. Anytime you are confronted with a situation that's getting you down, you need to pray that prayer. You need to learn how to do what Paul does. You need to learn how to ask God to help you see things the way they really are. Because how many of you know that sometimes what we see and our eyes play tricks on us? What we see is not what it really is. Sometimes what we hear is not what we really heard. I mean, many of you are, like me, are guilty of hearing something misinterpreted, and the whole week you're kind of developing this Netflix miniseries in your head. You know what I'm saying? Because you heard this one thing, and you've developed this whole series. Man, now you're in part five, and you're just dealing with this thing, right? And then you come to the end of the week, and you realize, you talk to the person, and the person says, that's not what I meant. That is not at all what I said. And, and, and there you are. You're feeling it because you just heard the wrong thing or maybe you saw the wrong thing. Sometimes what we hear and sometimes what we see plays tricks on us. And so this is why it's so important that you're saying, God, help me to see. Help me to see. Help me to understand. Help me to get the big picture, right? Because that is what gets you over the hump. That's what moves you forward when you're able to see the big picture. When you're able to see the big picture, right? And so God is, he's such a good God, you know. And, and let me tell you what happens. You know, when, when you're able to do this, when you face a trial or a setback or a hardship in faith, two things happen. First, man, it is an incredible witness to unbelievers, It's an incredible witness to unbelievers. When Christians handle big problems in faith, it is a witness to unbelievers. This is why Paul says, for everyone here, including the soldiers in the palace guard, they know that I'm here because of Christ. It's a great witness. Second, it's an encouragement to believers. Verse 14, Paul says, and because of my imprisonment, Many of the Christians here have gained confidence, and they've become more bold in telling others about Christ. It's a witness to unbelievers, and it's an encouragement to believers. You know, I want you to just think about this for a minute. Have you ever considered how that God might want to use a trial or a setback in your life to serve a greater purpose? You know, I've experienced things in my life, a lot of things, a lot of good things, but I've experienced a lot of painful things. I've experienced a lot of heartache, a lot of heartbreak, some of them from my own doing, from my own mistakes, my own failures, some of them that just happened. And at the time, I, 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 I couldn't tell you that I understood why certain things were happening in my life. But like they say, you know, you know what is it, 2020, you're, you know, hindsight is 2020. You know, as I look back at my life, and I, I recognize some of these things have, have, that have happened in my life. I recognize how God has often used the painful things in my life to be an incredible blessing to other people. I've had the opportunity to speak into people's lives that I never dreamed that I would be able to speak into their lives. 
I've had the opportunity to minister to people that I've never thought I would minister to. But because of my experience, God has put me in a place where I've been able to talk to marriages and families and individuals and people in prison. You know, I've, I've talked to people on death row and have shared the gospel with them. I've been overseas, I've been in Europe, I've been around the world and been able to do things that I never dreamed I would able, be able to do because of some of the experiences, some of the hardships, some of the painful things that I've gone through. But God has used those things to be a benefit to other people. I've talked to young couples who are starting their families where Kathy and I, we look at them and we say, we identify with you because we were kids. Kathy and I were 19 years old. We were 19 years old when we got together. 38 years later, I mean, God is good. Can you say amen? God is good, man, because, but again, have you ever thought that God might want to use this thing in your life for something good, for something to be an encouragement to somebody else? Because that's what he does, right? You've heard me say this before. God never wastes our pain. He recycles it. He recycles it and he uses it for his glory and for the good of people. For the good of people, right? And so regardless of what's happening in your life, ask God, help me to have the big picture. Help me to see things from your point of view, God. Number two, never let other people control your attitude. Never let people control your attitude. You can never let anyone decide whether you're going to be joyful or not, right? In this section, Paul mentions four kinds of people. Critics, those who are slandering him, who are creating all kinds of controversy. In verses 15, it says, it is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. That word rivalry is actually better translated quarrelsome, right? It's the Greek word eris, and it speaks of people who love to argue. How many of you know people that love to argue? I'm sure you do, that people that love to argue, they love conflict, they love to create controversy, they're contentious, they're divisive, they're critical, right? Notice what Paul says, they are jealous and quarrelsome. When people criticize, you know, something in your life, it's usually because of a few things, but one of the main things is usually because they're jealous. They're jealous or maybe they're envious, you know? Again, there are a few things that rob us of joy faster than when people begin to pick us apart begin to criticize us, right? When you're criticized by people you love or by your friends, right, <clears throat> it, could be very, it could be very heavy to you. It could be a heavy weight that you bear because how many of you would agree that, I mean, let's be honest, you may not ever verbalize this, but how do you feel when people don't like you? Does it feel very good when somebody doesn't like you? You're like, why don't you like me? What's up? Well, I mean, I'm a nice person, right? But, I mean, when somebody doesn't like you, you know, it, it just doesn't feel good, right? You know, it, it's, it's what we call being human. Being human is we all want to be accepted. We all want to be liked, right? And, and uh, you know, sometimes when people criticize us, it's, it's, it's very hurtful. Well, let me give you, you know, as I said through this series, I'm going to be giving you happiness hints. Let me give you a happiness hint. I don't need other people's approval or permission to be happy. I don't need people's approval or permission to be happy. Remember, you're as happy as you choose to be, as you choose to be. If they're unhappy, well, guess what? That's their choice. That's their choice. But don't let anybody control your attitude, right? You don't need other people's approval to be happy. You can't let people hijack your attitude and and oftentimes, one of the reasons why so many of us are unhappy in life is because our happiness has been hijacked by somebody's bad attitude, right? How many of you as a family, let's just be honest. I mean, I remember when my kids were young, we were going to Disneyland, and all of a sudden, Kathy and I had a blowout. We're like, forget Disneyland. None of us are going to, let's all go back home. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or is it just me? You know what I mean? You guys know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, everything's good. The kids are excited. And on, on something, there's a blowout, and the whole thing is done. Forget it. Nope, we're not doing it. We're not going here. We're not going there. Forget the ice cream. It's over. It's done. Right? You know what I mean? And that's how it happens. You know, people can hijack that real quick. And it's so important that we don't allow people to do that. You know what I mean? Because, again, I mean, we're in control. We need to be in control. Right? 
The second, Paul, uh, second group of people Paul talks about are comrades. These are friends. Verses 15 and 16, he says, Others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. These are the people who brought him joy, who supported him in his ministry. So he talks about comrades. And then he talks about competitors in verses uh, 17. Others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition. As much as I hate to say this, but there are people who do things sometimes for the wrong reasons. They do the right things for the wrong reasons. There are people in ministry, you know, who shouldn't be in ministry because it's all about ego for them. You know, it, again, they're, they're, there's a lot of things like that. And Paul had these kind of people in his life. And the fourth group of people in verse 17 he talks about is con conspirators. These are people who just want to cause drama. How many, of you have, how many of you have those kind of people in your life? They're just the walking soap opera. You know what I mean? They're just constantly bringing drama to you, man. It's, it's like watching days of your lives or I don't know what it is today. You know what I mean? Back in my day was all my children and all that crazy stuff. I remember uh, Kathy and I, when we were young, we used to watch General Hospital. I know that's kind of stupid, but, you know, we would watch this, this, this show, right? And uh, my father-in-law would always come home and he'd watch us. He goes, you know, you two have enough problems of your own. Why are you watching this show? Why are you watching this show? Isn't that true? Why do we watch other people's problems? We got enough problems of our own to be watching dramas, right? You know what I mean? But yet we do. And we wonder why we have more drama in our life. You know what I mean? It's crazy. But Paul had these kind of people. He had critics, comrades, competitors, and conspirators. With the exception of the, uh, the comrades, these three kinds of people can rob you of joy if you let them, right? This is why you need to determine to take control of that. Right? And I love what Paul says here in verses 18. He says, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached. Either way, look what he says, so I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. I love that. What Paul is saying here is, I'm not going to let other people control my attitude. I'm not going to let anybody hijack my happiness is what Paul is saying. Right? There may be people that criticize, that compete, that conspire. But you know what? That doesn't matter to me, Paul says. I'm not going to let anybody steal my joy. I'm not going to anybody take my peace, right? And so it's so important that we are control, in, in control of that and that you understand that that is your choice. That is your decision, not somebody else's, but that's your decision. The third habit that Paul models in the face of unexpected difficulty is I always trust God to work things out. And I kind of alluded to this already but this is what's been called the faith factor. The faith factor. When you're going through a problem, you've got two options. Listen very closely what I'm going to say. You have two options. You can worship or you can worry. You can worship or you can worry. You can pray or you can panic. Those are your options. You can worship or you can worry. You can pray or you can panic and get all freaked out. It's up to you. It's up to you. But what happens when we pray? Paul's going to talk about this later in Philippians chapter 4, right? He says, he says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. You can pray or you can panic. You could worship or you could worry. The choice is yours. Paul says this. I love this. At the end of verses 18, Paul says, I will continue to rejoice. I want you to catch that. He says, I will. What is that an indication of? Right? It's an indication of joy is an act of the will. I will. It's, an, it's a decision that you make. It's a choice that you make. Verses 19, for I know that as you pray for me and as the spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, all that's happened will turn out for my deliverance. I mean, what a powerful thing. Paul understood something that we need to understand. Our will is powerful. We just need to exercise it, right? Some of you have a weak will because it's like a muscle. You don't exercise it, and you need to exercise it, and you need to be very specific about some of the choices and the decisions that you make, right? Not allowing people to steal your joy, right? And so it's very important that I understand this, that, you, that we understand this, right? Um, and I love what Paul says here 
he, he points out, he gives us four sources of strength. And this is a powerful verse. He, in verses 19 says, For I know that as you pray for me and as the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, all that's happened will turn out for my deliverance. I mean, four sources of strength that he tapped into, right? So that helps you to stay positive and keep a joyful attitude. Number one, he says, for I know, right? It's what you know that keeps you going. It's what you know, right? Remember, don't base your, your thoughts, your theories on things that are not sure, but base your thoughts and your theories on things that you are certain about. He says, I know God is working this out. I know he is. Second, Paul says, as you pray for me, Paul says, I have people praying for me. I mean, I tell you what, there's nothing more encouraging than when you know that people are praying for you. Like, I'm always encouraged because I know that there are people that are praying for me. Number three, Paul says, and the spirit of Jesus Christ helps me. Paul says, I have the Holy Spirit at work in my life that is empowering me. And last thing he says, and this will lead to my deliverance. In other words, I have faith that God is going to work it all out. I've got perspective, I've got prayer, I've got the Holy Spirit, I've got faith. And because of these things, I can be joyful. I can be joyful, right? The last thing, or the last habit, I should say, that Paul models in the face of unexpected difficulty is, I stay focused on my purpose, not my problems. Do you have a purpose? That's what you got. A lot of people, they, they don't understand what their purpose is, right? But Paul stayed focused on his purpose, not his problems. If I stay focused on my purpose, not my problems, guess what? I can be joyful even when life seems to be falling apart because I understand what my purpose is. You know, Paul is an older man by this time. He's in prison. He's a long way from home. He's in Rome. He's awaiting execution by Nero. These are not exactly the best of times for Paul. These are not the best of times as we've gathered. They've taken everything away from him. They've taken his friends. They've taken his freedom. They've taken away his privacy. He's got a guard chained to him 24 hours a day. But there's one thing they couldn't take away from Paul. They couldn't take away his purpose. They couldn't take his purpose and his ability to choose, right? Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Viktor Frankl says this. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who was taken to one of the Auschwitz death camps in Nazi Germany. All of his family and all of his friends were being gassed and murdered. And he said, I remember one day when we stood in front of the Gestapo stark naked. They'd taken away everything, our clothes, our dignity. They'd even taken away my wedding ring, and I stood there with nothing at all. But all of a sudden, I realized there was one thing they could not take away from me. It was my choice and how I would respond Nobody could take that away from me. I cannot control what other people do to me. I cannot control what other people do around me. But I can control how I respond. I can control how I respond. Paul's saying that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay focused on my purpose even though they've taken everything away from me. And that's so important. When you have a purpose, when you have a purpose for living, You can be joyful because you know what your purpose is, right? And that's why he says this in verses 22. If I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, he says, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help. All of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And Paul is an amazing man because, again, what's he talking about? He's talking about that he had a purpose for living and he even had a purpose for dying. He was so focused. He said, look, if I remain here, I will continue to be a blessing to you. But if God should choose to take me home, guess what? I'm going home to be with Jesus. I'm going to heaven. He was focused, right? And so it's so important that, again, we remain focused purpose-driven. We are purpose-driven. We don't allow, we don't allow things to, our problems to, to, to rob our perspective and our focus because that's so easy to do. You know, a lot of times people are so miserable because, again, they've lost sight of what's important. Ask yourself, what's important in life? What's the most important things in your life? Is it your possessions? Is it your pleasures? Is it your money? Is it your things? 
What, what are the most important things to you? Again, because that will determine how happy you're going to be in life. If you understand what's really important, then you know what? You'll be happy. But if you don't, I'll tell you what, you'll find yourself very miserable in life. And so, you know, what are you living for? Or should I ask, who are you living for? Really important questions to ask yourself, right? And so for Paul, as he sums up, and I'm going to wrap up uh, this morning, and he, he sums up the, uh, this, his purpose in verse 21. He says this, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. That was his purpose. That's what drove him. For me to live is Christ. If somebody came up to you today, and I'm wrapping up, and asked you to fill in the blank, what would you use? For me to live is what? What is it? Is it entertainment? For me to live is entertainment. For me to live is the Lakers or the Dodgers. And the Lakers, like, nope, not the Lakers. <laughs> right? Not the Dodgers, right? For me to live is to acquire possessions. For me to live is prominence, popularity. For me to live is to be successful. For me to live is to become rich and famous. You fill in the blank. For you to live is what? What is it? For Paul, he had a clear sense of purpose. For me to live is Christ. You want to know the ultimate way that you can have joy no matter what you're facing in life is when you have Jesus living in your heart. That's where it comes from. Remember, happiness is a word that is de uh, derived from the word happenings, right? We are, happy, we are happy when our happenings are, you know, positive, right? But joy is the byproduct of the Holy Spirit living inside of you as a result of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said, for me to live is Christ. You need to answer that question. What does it mean to you? For you to live is what? Amen. Let's pray today. Father, thank you, God, for your word. I pray today, Lord God, that we would leave, Lord, with a, a deeper and greater understanding of some of the habits of happiness, some of the things that produce joy in our lives, God. Lord, so often we are per, in pursuit of things, Lord, that may produce a, a moment of happiness, but they're so temporary, Lord, in the light of eternity, in the light of our lives as a whole, the things that we waste our time and our energy in, Lord, often amount to very little, Lord, if anything. And so, God, open our eyes. Help us to see things as they really are, Lord. Help us to have the right focus, the right priorities, and to have the right people and person in our life. Ultimately, that's you, Jesus. And so as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I just want to talk to those of you who, very briefly, who may not know Christ and give you an opportunity to receive Christ into your heart right at your seat in the quiet of your own mind, in the quiet of your own heart. You know, maybe you are dealing with some things right now that it's hard for you to wrap your head around. But I want to tell you, you know, having Jesus in your life, I'm not going to tell you it causes you to understand everything. But all of a sudden, you sense his peace. And that peace gives you this joy that is able to sustain you through some of the hard times that we go through in life. And because God loves you, he continues to speak to you, he continues to love on you, he continues to minister to your life, even in those very hard times. And so if that's you today, and you feel like, you know what, I want to invite Christ into my life, right at your seat, you just say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for my sins and rising from the dead. Lord, I want to serve you as best as I can. And so, Lord, just fill me with your spirit today. God, and lift my spirits, I pray. Help me not to be controlled by what other people do or say, Lord God, but, Lord, just to be led by your spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I also want to take a moment... If you're here and you're a Christian and <clears throat> there are some things in your life that you're not happy about and you're just, you're, you got turmoil in your heart and in your life and you need prayer. You, know, you don't need to go into details because God knows where you are. He 
knows what it is. If that's you, would you lift up your hands so I can pray for you? Amen. I see those hands. Amen. Lift them up. All right. Father, you can put them down. Father, I pray for all of those who lifted their hands. God, you know their circumstances. You know the situation that they're in. I pray, God, that you meet them there. You meet them right where they are and that you give them the big picture. Help them to see things through your lens, from your perspective, from the, the perspective of your word, Lord God, that helps them to, Lord God, make sense of some of the things that they're facing and dealing with and that you would give them the wisdom and the grace and the courage that they need to move forward and to make the decisions, Lord, that would bring glory and honor to you. And so I pray for each person that raised their hands, Lord, bless them, meet with them, minister to them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand as we worship?